sounded oh so sweet. Well, oh, 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 came down from the head to the sole of my feet. Well, oh, 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 get away, get away, Jordan. So get away, get away, oh, get away, oh, oh, get away, oh, oh, get away, 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 oh, get away,
Francis, play us some music for about two seconds, and everybody just turn around and wave at each other and welcome each other, and then we'll have uh, Brother John Hoots come and bring our message tonight. Yeah. 
good? Is that better? Okie doke. All right, so let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. Tonight we're going to talk about God's gold medalist. So let's start with uh, verse 24 there. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receives the prize. So run that you may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is tempered in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, and so fight I not as one that beateth the ear, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your word, for the power that's in your word, and we, we think about all those who are struggling right now, and Lord, we just pray that you would just touch them, and uh, pray that you would, each person that uh, in our church here, this uh, battling COVID, Lord, I pray that you would touch them and that you would give them a speedy recovery. And Lord, I pray that you would help me now as I speak. I pray that you would give me the power that I need and the boldness. I pray that your word would be proclaimed in a way that would help us to be encouraged to serve you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so um, if you see here in this passage then, we can see that Paul is um, referring to a race, Okay. And that happens many times in Scripture. He, Paul refers to a race. Uh, it's used, uh, some of the terms that we see in the Bible are used that they're military terms. Some of them are even athletic terms. And in Jude verse 3, the Bible says, I don't have that for you, but Jude verse 3, the Bible says that we should contend for the faith. And what does it mean to contend for the faith? Uh, we think about contending for the faith, and some people think, well, okay, well, that's, that's really just standing for standards and making sure that we don't give up on the standards and we don't go back on this and, you know, that kind of thing. Then other people would say, okay, well, that just means uh, we've got to make sure that we have the right denomination. We've got to have everything correct by the T, and, and uh, we've got to fight for that. That's contending for the faith. But really, contending for the faith is really not about fighting with each other. Contending for the faith is about well, we have three enemies. What are those three enemies? We have the world system, we have the devil, and then we have the flesh. So contending for the faith really involves struggling with ourself and contending with ourself. Because when we were born again, God changed us, and now we have a, we have a uh, holy, we have the Holy Spirit living in us. So there's a battle going on every day, Paul says, in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. He talks about the struggle between the spirit and the flesh. Verse 16, I think, uh, tells us there's a war going on. There's a battle going on. And you have a battle going on in you between the new nature and the old nature. And by the way, that battle is not going to be over until Jesus comes again and we get our glorified bodies or until we go home to see him. So when we think about the, the contending for the faith, we're struggling with ourselves, and we're struggling also, though, for excellence, to be the best that we can be for God. And that's the battle that we have with the flesh. Now, the word um, strive that we see in this passage here, the actual Greek word is athleo. Now, when you think about athleo, what does that word sound like? It sounds like an uh, athlete, Right? Uh, and that's what Paul is using here. He's making a comparison or analogy between the Christian walk and the Christian race, so to speak, and the Greek games that they used to have during those times. So the, the word athleo means to strive as an athlete. And by the way, Christians, once, once, um, once Jesus ascended and Christians began to grow the church, they were persecuted, and they became known as athleos, or athletes. Christians were known as athletes because they were striving. They were contending. They were trying to be the best that they could be for God, and they faced a lot of persecution a lot of times. There's a, there's a book uh, that was written, I think, in the first century. The title of it was Thomas the Athleo, or Thomas the Athlete. So we know then that um, there's a struggle going on. So how can we be God's gold medalist? We talk about 
gold medalist. Uh, how many of you in here have ever been in a race? You ever been in a race? Yes? Maybe it was just in the backyard, or maybe it was a big-time race, or maybe you've won a state championship. I don't know, but you've been in some different races. Maybe you've been in a race with a car. Chad, don't you put your hand up now. All right, sir. Um, so you, we've been in some races, right? And we think about races, and we go to the track, right? Maybe we go to, uh, to watch a NASCAR race at a track, right? Um, there's a group of people there that's watching those people race. Uh, when I play something, I like to, I like to win. Do y'all like to win? Yeah, I want to win. I don't care if we're playing checkers or whatever. Uh, I, I know Abby's only like five or six years old, but guess what? We play checkers, I'm playing to win, right? So, um, so again, when we, when we think about the, the struggle that we go through, though, as believers, how can we be God's gold medalist? So let's try to run, run through this passage here, and we'll talk about it a little bit. First of all, God's gold, gold medalist obeys the rules of the game. If you got that for us, he obeys the rules of the game. Now, what is our rule book? Our rule book is the Word of God. And by the way, that, that word obey, we get to where we're using that less and less these days, aren't we? Because it's not about obeying or making any kind of rules or anything like that. We don't want to talk about anything like that that's going to kind of restrict me or uh, take away my comfort, so to speak. But our rule book is what? Our rule book is the Word of God. Our rule book is the Word of God. Now, uh, when I was in training camp with the Denver Broncos, we had a playbook. And an NFL player, the playbook is so valuable because it has all the plays in it, and you need to learn the plays. You've got to know the plays. Uh, if you were to misplace your, your uh, playbook, it cost you a game check. So let's say you, you made uh, $16 million a year. Well, that means... Um, you, you would lose a game check for losing your playbook, so you would lose a million dollars because you misplaced your, your playbook. That's how important the playbook is to an NFL player. Uh, we, were, we were running plays one day, and the running backs coach, uh, we were putting in about 20 plays a day, and uh, I was learning two positions, fullback and tailback, and so I was learning about 40 plays a night, and you would have, you put the plays in at 10 o'clock at night, and then you had to study and be prepared the next morning to run those plays. And I remember one day we were running plays, and my running back coach, I messed up, and he, he turned to me and said, Hoots, he said, to be so smart, you were one of the dumbest guys I ever met because I didn't know my playbook. And you know, sometimes that we do dumb stuff like that as Christians, as believers, and it just shows that we are not in the playbook, so to speak. We're not in... The Bible really knowing what pleases God and what doesn't please God. How can I know what pleases God? Well, one, we got to know Him. But two, we got to know about Him. And that's why God has given us this. He's given us this word then to help us to see what pleases Him and what pleases Him then. So here's, here's something that really matters in our life. To know Him is to love Him. To love Him is to please him, to want to please him. To please him is to make us holy. So when we know him, we love him, we want to please him, and then we become holy. And we are, that's what God has called us to do, is to be holy. He says that in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, that we are to be holy. That's a command, isn't it? How are we going to become holy? We've got to become holy by pleasing him when we become holy then we glorify him other people see the christ in us and we glorify him so yes the playbook is important yes the word of god so that we again are knowing what pleases god number two we don't want to be disqualified paul says that in verse 27 of verse 9 or chapter 9 he says i keep under my body and bring it into subjection lest that be any means when i preach to others i myself have become a castaway so Paul's saying, hey, I've worked hard. And he, he talks about that in chapter 9. Uh, and he's really he's talking about how he's serving the, the Lord and how he's going to preach the gospel whether he's able to, to, to make, any, uh, make his living or, or, or not. He's going to preach it, period. 
But when we come to this then, we see that he don't want to preach to others and then become a castaway. Or the word there's adokimos, which means um, to um, be disqualified, to be disapproved. To be disqualified or to be dis disapproved. Have you ever been uh, maybe in uh, some type of game or race or something like that and you got disqualified? You think about NASCAR, there's if certain things, hey, just because you cross the finish line first don't mean you're winning. You bet they're going to take the car out and make sure everything was right. If not, you could be disqualified, right? I remember when I was a sophomore in uh, high school, we were racing against Star Mount. It came down to the last race, which is the 4x4. Four four. We had a really good 4x4 four four team that year. And in fact, we set the school record. But it came down to the last race, and we were winning the race as we came in the last turn there. We, we sprinted toward the last turn, and there was a guy that started running beside a guy from the infield, one of the Forbush uh, track players that started running beside that anchor man on the 4x4 four four team, and guess what happened? We got disqualified. We got disqualified because that's considered aiding a runner when you're running beside him and you're cheering him on. So we ended up losing the track meet because we were disqualified. We don't want to be disqualified. We don't, hey, some of us in here, we're getting close to the home stretch. Now's not the time to be letting up. You know what um, David said? When I am old and gray-headed, gray oh God, forsake me not until I've shown thy strength, thy strength to this generation and thy power to everyone that is to come. Now's not the time to let up. We're on the home stretch. Some of us are on the home stretch, right? And we don't want to be disqualified. We want to run, we want to finish strong for the Lord. So, one, he obeys the rules of the game. Two, he is a team player. Let's look at that. He is a team player. If you want to fill that in there on your blanks. So, that person who's God's gold medalist, he's a team player. So teamwork then is a necessity. Uh, we are urged to strive together for the gospel in Philippians 1, verse 27. That word, again, strive there, the, the Greek word there is soon athleo. Soon athleo could be translated athleting together. So we're working together. We are we're working. God made us in community. That person out there that says, hey, I don't have to go to church. I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. Yeah, you're right. You don't have to go to church to be a Christian. But God designed it that way. God wants you in community. He wants you contributing to the cause of Christ. He wants you to, uh, to provide those gifts that he has provided through the power of the Holy Spirit to the church. He wants you to display those gifts. It's important that we strive together, that we are uh, living in community as a the church. Now, let me ask you this question. If, one, if a donkey could pull a thousand pounds, it would just be safe to assume that, a, that two donkeys could pull what? Two thousand pounds. That's normally what you would think, right? But actually, that's not true. A donkey can pull a thousand pounds, but two donkeys can pull eleven thousand pounds. Why? Because they're a team. They're working together as a team. And it's not just a matter of doubling. It's a matter of being exponential. When we work together as a team for the cause of Christ, then that's when we get work done. And then we strive together with one spirit and one mind. You see that there? We're striving together with one spirit and with one mind. So I think it's important then that we realize that we have to obey the rules of the game. We're going to be God's gold medalist. We're going to stand before him. And that's what, that's what we're after. We're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. It's not to um, determine our salvation, but it is to receive rewards. We are going to receive rewards for the work that's been done. It's, just, it's not just a matter, okay, I'm saved now, I'm, I'm sitting on the bench, so to speak, and I'm all happy about it. No. When we get saved, we're in the game. 
And that's where we want to be. We want to be serving God with the gifts that he's given us and the opportunities that he's, he's provided for us. So the next thing then we'll talk about, let's look at verse 25, uh, which says, And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now, they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. And so we see right here then, he's talking about striving for the mastery. What does that mean, he's striving for the mastery? Well, that means he is disciplined, if you want to... Uh, to jot that down. He's disciplined. As a disciplined person, a disciplined believer, then what we have to do? One, we're going to exercise self-control. If someone is temperate, that word temperate there is, self, is self-control. And by the way, this um, incorruptible crown, the Bible teaches us then that this is one of the crowns that we will receive that we can be able to toss back at Jesus' feet when we are exercising self-control. Now, when we talk about that, that is telling the body what to do. So you've got to tell your body what to do. Do you tell your body what to do or your body tells you what to do? We need to tell our body what to do. Um, sometimes it's got to be we don't do what we want to do, we do what we ought to do. If you were training for a race, if you were training for the Olympics, and Olympic athletes, what do they do? Do you think they sit around and eat Oreos all the time? Okay. Do you think they're um, a drinking soda pop and eating Oreos and just hanging out? Oh, yeah, well, you know what? When it comes time, I'll get out there and race and see how I do. No, they are on a strict diet. This was true back in Paul's day, and that's why he's given this Example here. They're on a strict diet. They're eating things that's going to, to help their body to perform at the highest potential. They're keeping their muscles hydrated. They're conditioning themselves. They're pushing themselves when they're, when they're conditioning and they're saying, I don't want to run another sprint, but they run another sprint. I don't want another run another. I don't want to get out of bed this morning because it's raining out and I'm going to take a day off. No, nope, they push themselves. They don't do what they want to do. They do what they ought to do. Now, here's the thing that we need to do then. We need to tell our body what to do, spiritually speaking. We need to tell self, hey, I'm not going to put that in my mind. I'm not going to put that garbage in my mind because it's going to take me away from God. It's not going to draw me closer to God. I can't, I can't uh, allow uh, all the things of the world to come into my mind and expect me to be in tune with God. I can't do that. It won't happen. Garbage in equals what? Garbage out. Jesus said that. He said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Right? What we put into our heart, what we allow into our, our soul and our spirit is going to come out. So it's so important then that we are in the Word every day. We've got to be in the Word every day. We've got to go to church when we have an opportunity to go to church. We need to pray every day. We need to memorize Scripture. All of those are just basic fundamentals that a believer should be practicing. Do we want to be God's gold medalist? Do we want to be able to stand before him and he say, well done, good and faithful child? Now, one of the ways that we can help ourselves with that is uh, to get rid of the flap. Get rid of the flap. Okay, well, what's flap? Have you ever had something that was flapping? You might have a you know, somebody say, well, yeah, my, my wife's mouth flapped. No, just kidding. Uh, have you ever, maybe when um, a tire, you ever had a tire that was flapping? You ever had a tire that was flapping? Yep. Boy, that don't sound good. You ever had something maybe come loose on your car that's flapping? Yep. Well, you know what? That kind of holds you back, doesn't it? And this, you better be finding a place to stop. Well, you know what flap is? Flap is four things. One is fear. Two, lust, that's the L. A is anger, and P is pride. And most of the time, when we get in trouble with our discipline and our self-control, it's because of those four things. We're either afraid of something, so we don't do what we ought to be doing because we're afraid. And by the way, I heard it, it was, I don't know who the preacher was on the radio this last week, but that's where I got the flap, okay? Um, the L is the lust, 
many times is it what's getting you sidetracked? What's getting you distracted? What's keeping you out of the Word? Is it lust? When we have lust in our heart, it's going to be hard for us to be Spirit-filled. We're not going to be able to have the power of the Holy Spirit in our life if we have lust in our heart. If we have anger, if we're mad at someone, how many times do we get in trouble because we lose our temper? What, what does the Bible say here? He's temperate in all things. The anger, is the anger what gets you in trouble? Ask God to help you with that. How about pride? Many times it's just a matter of we, we think it's, we're right about it and everybody else is wrong about it, and that pride is what really hurts us. So if we want to be God's gold medalist, we've got to be disciplined. Now the other thing is that the gold medalist realizes that the race is not a sprint, but a marathon. It's not a sprint, it's a marathon. Uh, you know, there's races that, you know, you have a 100-yard 100 meter dash, you have the 200 meter, you have like a 400 meter, you have like a um, 5K, you got like a 10K, and then you've got um, marathon. Well, the marathon fits our category here. Because guess what? It's a marathon. It's a marathon in that we can't just take a sprint and go real hard for God and then quit. We've got to be consistent. We've got to develop habits. When you develop habits, duty becomes what? Delight, right, Bailey? Duty becomes delight. When you say, now we all know there are some days when we have our quiet time. When we have our quiet time, some days are just, it's just like you're just full of the Lord, and other days maybe it's not quite so. But we have our quiet time every day. We spend time just like reading the, reading the Word. You know, you can read a chapter a day. We're challenging you as a church or us as a church to read one chapter a day. If we do that, then that's going to help us then. But we develop those habits, and those habits then are who can run the fastest for the longest. That's what a race should be. And by the way, your race, you have a race to run. Everybody in here has a race to run. And it is an individual race. And I'm not running against you, and you're not running against me, and I'm not running against, against somebody else over here. I'm running against myself. And I'm running for the Lord. Now, if we look at Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1, verse 1 and 2, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight, and the sin which does so easily beset us. And let us run with ra uh, patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So when we see this verse here, this is in after the great Hall of Fame chapter. And chapter 11 is talking about Abraham and, and different ones that Moses, that... that uh, were, were living for God and how God had used them. And then it comes into verse 1 and says, since we have so many witnesses. In other words, so many people that have shown us, hey, this can be done because we have done it. God has done it through them. Then what should we do? We should lay aside every weight. And what is it that's weighing you down? What is the weight, what is the weight that's keeping you from running like you want to run? Would you try to run a marathon in uh, your, deer, your deer hunting boots? I hope you wouldn't. You wouldn't get too far, would you? You, wanna, you want something that's lightweight. Do you ever see people out there running a marathon and they're, they're clothed from head to toe in like a ski gear or something like that? Nope. They're running light. Why? Because they don't want any weight that's holding them back. They want it to be light. So it's important that we lay aside the weight. Sometimes it's not necessarily a sin, but it becomes a sin because it's weighing you down. If it's keeping you from being all that you can be for God, then why don't you give it up? Why don't you give it up? So you can run the race. So that you can run your race. It's your race. You're running it for the Lord. Lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us and run with patience or endurance the race that is set before us. It's the race that you've been given. 
When someone passes away, you know what's happened? They finished the race. It doesn't matter how old they are. They are finishing their race. It's the race that God has given them to run. Now, by the way, that person who is in the will of God is immortal. When you are doing the will of God for your life, nobody can stop you, nobody can kill you, nobody can take you out. God has a purpose for your life. And if we run our race, we're going to run that race until he calls us home and we can hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. So there's going to be some straining and there's going to be some training to gain the crown. Some straining and some training to gain the crown. Put that word straining in there if you like to. And then the next thing is that gold medalist keeps his eye on the gold. Keeps his eye on the gold. You see that there in verse 2 of chapter 12. What does it say? Looking unto Jesus. Do you have your eyes on Jesus? It's so easy to get distracted. There's so many things in the world that can pull us away. Just like the flap. It can happen in a second. It's important that we keep our eyes on Jesus. We're looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. What kept him going? What made him go to the cross? He was in the garden and he said, Hey, Lord, does it have to be this way? Not my will, but thine. And what did he do? For the joy that was set before him. The joy of what? The joy of knowing that he was going to forgive our sins. He's going to please the Father, go to the cross, and forgive us of our sins. Just like Pastor Jared was preaching on Sunday. So when we see that, looking unto Jesus. We've got to keep our eyes on the Lord. We've got to keep our eyes on the goal. Paul talked about in Philippians chapter 3, verse 14, that he was pressing toward the mark. And he basically was saying, hey, I'm heading down the home stretch. I'm trying to finish strong. I'm trying to go across that finish, finish line strong. And he's going with everything that he's got. Why? Because he's pressing toward the mark. You know what gets you in trouble? One of the things that, that you will learn as a, uh, a track person is that you never look where? You never look back. You never look behind you. When you see somebody that's looking behind them, they're not very experienced. Because what happens when you start looking back, you know what happens? It's going to slow you down. You never look back. When you're looking back, it's going to slow you down. I remember back um, years ago, Larry Fitzgerald was playing in the Super Bowl. And he, uh, I think it was the, the um, Cardinals and the Steelers. And he caught a pass with about two minutes left. And as he was running, you could see his eyes look at the Jumbotron. The Jumbotron is in the uh, end zone because he knew better than to look back. But he could look at the Jumbotron and see who was getting close to it. And of course, he finished the play and scored the touchdown, but they ended up losing the game uh, because the Steelers came back and scored a touchdown. But the point is he knew not to look back. When you're running a race, you don't look back. Well, you know what happens with us sometimes? We start looking back. We start thinking about all the mistakes we've made and all the ways we've failed God and how this didn't happen for us or that didn't happen for us. And we start really questioning ourselves. And you know what happens? We start having a pity party. And the next thing you know, we got our eyes off Jesus and we're not going to please him like we would if we could get our eyes back on the Lord. Uh, I like the story about these, the two boys that were walking down the railroad tracks. And one of them was a really skinny kid, and he was walking down one side of the track. And the other, other one was a pretty heavy kid, okay? And he's walking down the other side of the track. So they're walking down the track. And it was seen that as they walked down the track, that the guy who was this kind of heavy guy, he was doing a really good job, and he would stay on the track, but the skinny kid, he would take a couple steps and then he would fall off the track and then he'd get back on the track and he just, and he, finally he says, well, how is it you can stay on the track and I can't? He said, well, it's like this. He said, I have this big belly so I can't look straight down. 
So I'm looking out down the track at the goal, and you, on the other hand, you're looking straight down, and every time you take a step, all you see is the rust and the stinkweed. And you know what? That's kind of how it is in life. If we're just looking at the rust and the stinkweed and all that mess on the sides, then guess what? We don't have our eyes on the goal. What is the goal? The goal is pleasing Christ. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Of faith. Uh, I remember when Jesse was uh, running track in high school, his goal at the beginning of the year was to break the record in the 400, 400 meters. And I remember he broke the record at North, North Wilkesboro, I think. But I can remember he looked toward us and then he raised his hands toward the Lord and um, that, to, that has just kind of stuck in my mind that that's, that's where we need to be looking. We're just looking to him. And all the things that we're doing here, and by the way, he would tell you that setting that record and getting, that, getting any kind of medal incorruptible it's not incorruptible it's corruptible it's not going to last what's going to last is what we do with our eyes on jesus what we do for him and then that leads us to the third one there which is uh running for the prize that that person who's running for the prizes we see here paul's talking about here in verse 24 you run all but one receives receives the prize if you're going to play play to win that's what Paul's basically saying. Play to win. Do you, would you, I would say Paul, as far as a person that had the perseverance, could you think of anybody that had more perseverance other than our Lord himself that had more perseverance? I mean, this is the guy that um, at, at Lystra, they took him out and stoned him and left him for dead. And we know he, he talked about that, about how he was caught up into the third heaven and he was left, to de- left for dead. Well, it, he came, the Lord, of course, allowed him to come back into his body. And you know what he did the next day? He preached. <laughs> the next day. Now, they stoned him for preaching. He went back and preached the next day. I think I would at least take a week off or something, wouldn't you guys? I mean, you think about... You think about Paul who's writing this. He was running for the prize. And he had his focus on pleasing the Lord. Uh, History tells us that he ran to the chopping block when he was beheaded. Why? Because he had his eyes on the Lord. Running for the prize. And then there's the uncertain runner. And what about that uncertain runner? How would it be to not have any kind of goals? What if you never had a goal to even get out of the bed? Or a goal to... What if you had athletics and let's say you had a football game. How could you have a football game without a goal? Well, you just couldn't. You're going to have a goal, right? Could you have a a, a basketball game without a goal? A soccer match without a goal? we got goals. Well, what is the goal? The goal is to put our eyes on Jesus, right? If you aim at nothing, what happens? Hit it every time, right, Paul? Now, I heard a story about the processionary caterpillar. They did a, in fact, they did an experiment. What they did is they took this um, pot, a fl- like a flower pot, it was a big pot, and they put the food that, that, that the caterpillars would eat in the middle of the pot, And then they placed the caterpillars on the rim of the pot. Now, processionary caterpillars are called processionary caterpillars because they follow each other. And so when they're traveling, okay, or walking, they look like they're a parade or whatever, a procession, because they're just following each other. And so what what happened in this experiment was these caterpillars kept walking around the edge of the flower pot until they all died. Sad, isn't it? The food that they needed was right there in the middle of the flower pot. But they all just followed each other in a big circle until they all died. Isn't that that crazy? Well, you know what? We're kind of like that. Where are you following somebody that's taking you nowhere? 
Do you have somebody in your life that's taken you nowhere or maybe that's taken you away from God and you're just following them? Are we just following the crowd? Are we just ever how the wind blows in this society that we're in now? So that certain runner got the eyes on Jesus. The uncertain runner, we don't know what their eyes are on. Not as uncertainly, not as one that beats the air in verse 26. So fight I, not as one that beats the air. What is that talking about? Well, Paul now has shifted to an analogy with boxing. And one of the things in boxing, they have the, the Greek word there is hypo piazzo, and it means this, it, ha, it means this spot right here underneath the eye. And what they would do is they, when they had a boxing match, if someone got, I'm assuming that, I don't know if they, I guess they did it without any kind of gloves, but I'm a, when, when someone would get hit right underneath the eye, then they would call that the knockout blow, the knockout punch. We ever, you, you, we've heard of that term, right? The knockout punch. Mike Tyson used to have a, have a one mean knockout punch. If he caught you with an uppercut, man, your history, it's over. So that's what Paul's referring to, though, is he's saying, I keep under my body. I give it the knockout blow. I'm giving the flesh the knockout blow because I'm going to serve the Lord. I'm going to bring it into subjection. That word there, subjection, really means to make your body a slave. You're telling your body what to do. You're telling your mind, your soul what to do because you are focused on pleasing the Lord. And then the other thing is this. The gold medalist is mentally tough. What do we mean by mental toughness? Mentally tough. When we have the mind of Christ, we can, we have the mind of Christ. We can be mentally tough. That's the ability to refuse to quit in spite of the score or the circumstances. Jesus refused to quit in the garden. He sweat, as it were, great drops of blood, but yet he still went to the cross. He went to the cross again, like we said, for the joy that was set before us. So the ability to refuse to quit in spite of the score or their circumstances. Now, um, I heard a story about a man in the Vietnam War. His, his name was Major Nesmith. And he was a POW for two years. And he was confined to a very small cage. Terrible living conditions, of course. When he finally was rescued, came home, and after a couple of weeks he recovered, one of the first things is he, he did was went out and play a game of golf. And he went out and played a game of golf, and he shot a 74. I don't know if we have any golfers in here, but a 74, I've... I've never shot a 74, and I never will shoot a 74. But this guy, after being in war and in Vietnam and POW in a cage for two years, shot a 74. And they asked him, he said, how in the world did you shoot a 74 and you haven't picked up a golf club? He said, well, you know what I did? He said, I played every day when I was in Vietnam. Went, what? Yeah, he said, I played in my mind. He said, every day I would play different courses and I would just think about my favorite course maybe and I would say, okay, I'm going to go up there and I'm going to hold number one then I'm going to hit the ball and it's going to go right down the side of the fairway so I have a great angle to the green and then I'm going to hit, hit it up on the green and I'm going to take two putts and I'm going to make a par. Or I'm gonna make... And so he would keep score and he just would play a game of golf in his mind. Now that's someone who was, of course, using that and thinking with a goal in mind to help him to persevere through the war. Now guess what? You know what? We're in a war. Your, our minds are attacked every day. Uh, again, it's not flesh and blood. It's principalities, wickedness in high places that we're fighting against. So as we're fighting each day, we need to keep our eyes focused. For the joy that's set before us, right? And then the other thing is a gold medalist for the Lord. I'm gonna, we're going to get this done here. 
He's determined to be the best he can be. He's determined to be the best that he can be. He strives for the mastery. That expression there is determined, determining to be the best that you can be. What have you mastered? Is there something that you're really good at that you have mastered? Probably the work that you do, you're, you have mastered it. If you've been doing it for a long time, you're getting really good at it. You've gotten good at it. People in athletics, they get really good at it. Uh, I was talking to a guy yesterday, 79 years old. He's, he uh, fought in Vietnam, and he was talking about how he would go back today if they needed him. He was uh, a loadmaster on a ship, and he said, I could do it. He's 79 years old. Now, he, he had, he's a loadmaster. He had mastered it, right? But when we think about mastering something, then, have we, are we striving for the mastery in the things of God? And being all that we can be for Christ. If we are striving for the mastery, then we're getting things done for God. And it's him that's doing it through us. Um, I remember the story of Larry Bird. Some of you know who Larry Bird is, one of, a really great basketball player, Hall of Famer. But when he was a freshman in high school, he was um, playing a state championship game as a freshman. With uh, just a few seconds left in the game, he was on the line shooting a one-and-one. One. So if he hit both shots, they win the game. If he hit one, they tie, go to overtime. So he gets up there, sinks both of them. The crowd goes crazy. They win the state championship with a freshman hitting two free throws with um, time running out, basically. After the game, they're interviewing him. And the reporter asked him, he says, what was going through your mind when you was up there as a freshman shooting two free throws to win a state championship? He said, I really didn't think much about it. He says, just like those 500 I shot this morning. So that morning he had shot 500 free throws. And he was very confident about hitting those free throws. Now, when we strive for the mastery, in other words, we, we try to be all that we can be for the Lord. Then we're going to have the Scripture. We're going to memorize Scripture. We're going to be in fellowship with the Lord. We're going, to have, we're going to be Spirit-filled. And we can make a difference in the lives that we touch. So he strives for the mastery. Then the gold medalist also develops every talent to its fullest potential. Every talent to its fullest potential. The word there, again, is develops every talent to its fullest potential. A couple things. One, never say no to an opportunity to serve God. Now, that sounds like a tall order, doesn't it? But you know, if God is putting something in front of you, and you know that he's putting something in front of you, take the step. Don't let fear keep you from doing something that God can use you to do and he's wanting to use you to do there's been so many times in my life when someone has asked me to do something and my first thought is I ain't doing that but then we do it and God of course was leading in that and he's going he's gonna to do it through you he just needs you to say yes right so never say no to an opportunity to serve God I was talking to a guy this week and uh, we used to have here at Peace Saving Youth Alive at Youth Alive, we would have around 1,000 teenagers that would come in, and they would, we would have preaching every night and singing. We would have uh, breakout lessons during the day, and then we would do some fun stuff, like go to Carowinds and that kind of thing. But we did that for several years. Tim Lee Ministries, Tim Lee was really putting on Youth Alive and bringing the preachers in, but we were doing the work here at the church. In fact, Jenny was uh, doing a lot of the administration and getting things lined up and that kind of thing. And it was very taxing. I mean, it was, it was very hard to do that. I mean, you're thinking about trying to um, really administrate all of that. It takes a lot of effort. And I can remember one night, I was just about, I mean, from, I was trying to, to work some too, and at the same time, uh, be all in with Youth Alive. But I remember one night, 
um, I was called up and said, hey, can you run over to the Y and pick up a kid? And I was like, I don't know if I can do one more thing. But you know, I, I, I remember going and picking him up and bringing him to Youth Alive that night. And he got saved that night. Now, if it had been up to me, you know, maybe he would have never received Christ. I don't know. And I was t- talking to another guy this week. And he was talking about he got saved at Youth Alive. Him and uh, another guy he was telling me about. And he talked about how there were times that he's been away from the Lord, but God convicted him. And he, he said, I just felt like, he said, I just felt dirty. I just felt like I need to, I need to take a bath inside. That's quite, kind of what David was saying in Psalm 51, right? But um, Nick is serving the Lord today. And he's very involved and sharing his faith. And um, the effort that goes into the things that we do, those opportunities that God gives us, it's worth it. God's going to use that. So do everything for God the best that you can do it. Colossians 3.23 says, whatever you do, do it hardly ask the Lord and not for yourselves, right? And then he gains the victor's crown, and this will be the last one. That gold medalist gains the victor's crown. What's the corruptible crown? The corruptible crown is the Stephanos with the laurel leaves. How long is that going to last? Not long. You're going to have, it's going to be withered away, right? Dr. James Dobson, uh, many of you know him, tells a story about when he was a, he was in college at uh, University of California at Berkeley and how he played on the tennis team and he worked so hard to be conference champion. And he was. He became conference champion, um, I guess, in the Pac-10. And they gave him the trophy and everything, and the trophy was placed in the um, trophy, trophy room there at the college. And about maybe 10 or 15 years later, he was back to the college, and he's walking in for a meeting, and he walks by a dumpster, and there at the dumpster is his trophy. I mean, here he had worked so hard to get that trophy, and now it's being thrown in the trash. And he said, the Lord just spoke to me. James, that's a corruptible crown. That's a corruptible crown. The incorruptible crown, what are the incorruptible crowns? The crown of righteousness. Those that love his appearing. The incorruptible crown we've talked about today, having temperance and self-control. The crown of life, enduring trials, James 1, 12 and Revelation 2, 10. The shepherd's crown to that pastor who's faithful. and um, Then the soul winner's crown, that crown of rejoicing, 1 Thessalonians 2, 19. So those are crowns that are incorruptible. We can take those crowns and we can toss those at Jesus' feet and we can hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. Right? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your word. And we thank you for showing us this example tonight. And I pray that you would help each of us to be the best that we can be for you. Help us in our struggle with ourself. Lord, we know there's so many times that we fail you, so many times that we sin. And Lord, we just thank you and praise you that regardless of of the times that we fail you, that you still love us, that you still forgive us. You said if we confess our sins, that you are faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So Lord, I just pray that you would help us to to think about that day when we stand before you, when we stand before the Bema, the reward seat, and we're able to receive rewards for those deeds that we've done with the right motive for you. And Lord, I pray that you would help maybe that one that you spoke to today about an opportunity that they have before them and they haven't acted on that. Lord, I pray that you would speak to them, help them to see that you are leading them in that direction. And then, Lord, we pray that you would help for those who maybe in their mind they're just feeling like quitting. 
They're feeling like giving up. They're feeling like, hey, somebody else can do that. Lord, I pray that you would speak to their heart. We pray that you would help those who have neglected you in their daily walk. Uh, maybe they haven't been in the Word, or they haven't been in prayer, or they haven't been attending church um, as you would have them to. Lord, I pray that you would speak to their hearts. To each of us, Lord, I pray that you would help us to serve you in a way that's pleasing to you, that we, you might say, well done, good and faithful servant. Lord, we thank you for this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so if y'all like to stand and we'll, we'll sing here. Um, at his feet, Brother John. That was good tonight. Um, service, Sunday morning, 1030. We get to celebrate an empty tomb. Y'all be here Sunday morning. Thank you. <laughs>